Greetings, everyone. Uh, this is the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank uh, speaking to you uh, for part two of what's going to happen to our American Manufacturing Center if we have a national infrastructure bank that is very busy building uh, industrial projects all across the country. So I'm joined here today. Uh, my name is Al Fekka Mutardi. I'm a macroeconomist. Uh, I used to work for the International Monetary Fund, and now I'm the lead economist advising on this National Infrastructure Bank proposal. And I'm here with two experts uh, who know a lot about manufacturing and how to put projects together. I'm going to let them introduce themselves uh, when they start speaking, but uh, one of them is Stan Forzik, a former executive uh, with uh, 25 years experience from at, Am at Amtrak a railroad person and a finance person, and Lou Spencer, who is with the Virginia Building Trades and knows a lot about uh, water projects and electricity projects and construction projects. So I'd like to begin by uh, giving you a little bit of a background about where we are with manufacturing in the United States, and then I'll turn it over to the other speakers to flesh out our uh, topic in a little bit more detail. The state of American manufacturing uh, it, it's uh, falling behind, let's put it this way, um, as I'll show you uh, with a couple of slides. But the antidote for uh, the state of American manufacturing is a bill in Congress that would create a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. And this bank is sized to be large enough to cover all of our infrastructure needs, transportation, rail, water infrastructure, affordable housing, all those kinds of things. And when we lend uh, to owners of public infrastructure like cities and counties and states and public authorities to build this infrastructure, we'll be requiring a lot of construction inputs into the manufacturing. Uh, whether that's a bridge for a bridge or a highway or water pipe, broadband internet, all those things, we are going, this bill will require that they be made in the United States and that will really promote and bring back American manufacturing. And the NIB, the National Infrastructure Bank, can lend directly to these um, uh, manufacturing firms in, also in case there's uh, a supply chain bottleneck uh, and not enough of the units are being produced uh, at the current uh, point in time in the United States economy. So the really critical role of manufacturing is that it, it is an enabler of technical innovation, productivity gains, economic growth, and development of our, of our American workforce. And this is really uh, one major reason why we want to promote manufacturing. And also we wanna have the most 21st century state-of-the-art components to manufacturing. So what's happened to our manufacturing center? Um, we've lost a lot of jobs. Uh, this is a little graph here of uh, jobs in manufacturing, the actual count, and then jobs, uh, manufacturing jobs as a percent of the total. And you can see that in uh, the World War II buildup, uh, manufacturing jobs were comprising as much as 40% uh, of our workforce. But slowly over time, that percentage of workers who are involved in manufacturing has fallen way off. Since 1997, we've lost 25% of our manufacturing firms and 4.5 million jobs have gone overseas. So the causes of the decline included, uh, include a transfer of manufacturing jobs overseas, increased automation, and the decline of the US steel and coal industries. Now, some cities have adapted to this uh, decline in manufacturing by diversifying their economies uh, to produce more services or advanced manufacturings like specialty steels and those kinds of things. And other cities have attracted industries to their area for the first time, including the Southeast. Uh, but in 2017, uh, the U.S. had fallen behind, was now only the third largest industrial producer worldwide, which includes manufacturing, China being the largest. Industry there now comprises 40% of GDP, and in the United States, it's down below 20%. The European Union has also about that uh, 
um, amount of manufacturing. So uh, what we know about manufacturing, it is, the, it is a real innovator. It drives growth. Today, manufacturing accounts for 11% of our GDP, 8% of our uh, direct employment, but it drives 20% of our capital investment, 30% of our productivity growth, 60% of our exports, and 70% of our business research and development. So, so, so we have a smaller percentage of our economy with value added in manufacturing, only 70%, compared to 90% in China. That means we're importing a lot of components of manufacturing and then uh, putting them together in this country. But there are critical spillovers and reasons why manufacturing helps to drive economic growth. And that's why we want to reinvigorate in the United States. Here's an example of one area that re needs a reinvigoration. Uh, in January 2021, Congress passed a Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors or CHIPS for America Act. Uh, so that bill is on the books, but it has no money behind it coming from the budget uh, to invest in actual semiconductor industries. So the, United, the National Infrastructure Bank would be able to help finance those kinds of industries. I wanted to just list for you quickly the manufacturing, typical manufacturing inputs, uh, raw building materials, for example, are concrete, steel, wood, stone, and asphalt. Um, we, we also need, an, in addition to raw inputs, we need a lot of construction equipment. And then we need specialty items like electronics and computer chips, machinery, and robots. Here's a typical example, of course, of um, a construction project reasphalting a road. So you can see that the raw asphalt is um, a component of the construction going over top of a concrete base. And we need all of this uh, construction equipment. An innovation in this picture is that we're using waste chip plastic chips. Uh, recycled uh, and uh, melted down with the asphalt to recycle plastic waste, which was a which is the a great use of recycling in the economy. So uh, we want U.S. manufacturing. Uh, what we notice that is that U.S. manufacturing costs are escalating. Uh, it has much more to do. Not it is the uh, the source of the escalating construction costs uh, that have been ruled out. It's not on account of unit unions. It's not account on account of per unit labor or per unit construction material costs. It actually has to do with uh, a buildup of objections to having manufacturing done in my neighborhood, not in my neighborhood, and um, making uh, projects much more costly and uh, construction wise more convoluted like uh, spaghetti type uh, transportation interchanges. So our National Infrastructure Bank will be on top of taking care of all of those problems. But it, for the most part, we the basic driver in addition to the, the NIB uh, costing and uh, covering all of our construction inputs for manufacturing. We also have a Buy America provision in the act, which means that all of the iron, steel, and other manufacturing inputs that go into construction projects that are financed by the National Infrastructure Bank must be made in America. And that will, uh, the NIB will lend up to 500 billion a year for this additional infrastructure projects, require 100% Buy America, require paying Davis-Bacon wages to put more money into workers' pockets in the middle, and we'll be able to complement uh, the, 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 uh, the Buy America language that's in the, the bipartisan bill that was already passed by Congress. So keep in mind, we are now able to finance all of our infrastructure needs, pay for all the manufacturing inputs, all without recourse to new federal spending, taxes, or debt. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Stan Forsick, and he's going to tell you a little bit about uh, manufacturing inputs for rail construction. Thanks very much. So hi, all. I appreciate uh, the time and effort for you getting on uh, the NIB website to re review certain things. As Alfeca has mentioned, uh, this is a follow-up on what we've done before insofar as talking about manufacturing and how manufacturing will help grow uh, uh, the economy within the United States. And manufacturing doesn't get, get done right at the site on, on, sub, on some projects, whether they be rail projects or anything else. 
There are manufactured goods that have to be done at different sites. And that's what I want to talk about here today. I'm going to talk about rail passenger transportation, uh, which is a is a combination of high-speed rail, conventional rail, transit systems, and uh, light rail. Uh, as Alfeca mentioned, we're talking about uh, raw materials being turned into other products that are necessary for the, the overall big picture project that we're talking about. And here are some of the, uh, the uh, items that, are, that are, uh, I'm gonna be speaking about and that you should be aware of. Let's talk about rail for just a little while. Uh, rail is, is uh, actually stick, stick rail that's made out of steel. It's made into 39 foot long lengths. And uh, they use a template at the steel mills to have the, the rail come out that way. But the interesting thing about it is when we build a rail system, we have to have continuous welded rail. In other words, uh, we have to have one rail stretching for 30,000 miles. And that's exactly what uh, uh, welded rail does. Welded rail uh, is done by a gang. Uh, a kit is prepared at another location by a different type of organization. And three people are needed to put uh, uh, the rail in. If you look at this section of rail, you can see that it is welded together right here. So if we take the continuous welded rail and we put it, it in one and two mile lengths, uh, length is decided upon the topography of the, uh, the actual roadbed to move them out. And you can see here is a rail train and there are, this is about a mile long and there are 16 mile long rail units on it. And this gets transported down to build the rail system. On the right hand side here, you can see that it doesn't take a lot to put the rail in. This rail that's being put in place here is done by this gentleman here with this machine. If, you, if I had this to go out, the rail would be on the side of the roadbed, just like this. This machine lifts it up and puts it in place. There's a bigger machine in the back that provides most of the power, and that's uh, manned by about a five or 10 man gang because it all has to be fastened. So that's CW, CWR, or continuous welder rail. Concrete ties, we spoke about this before. Concrete ties are, are the most economical that, are, that uh, we can use. Uh, I believe Alfeca made the comment uh, a couple of weeks ago, what happened to, to uh, wood rail? Uh, it's not used anymore because it doesn't last that long. These last about 50 years. We need about 79.2 million of these concrete ties. They're usually made in maybe five or six places in the United States and then shipped around because we're going to use 2,600 of these ties for every mile of rail that's out there. We also have to manufacture different products that are associated with the rail, the plates, the clips, I'll show you that in a moment. Oh, here they are right here. These are clips and rail pads. You can see that we need 158 plus million plates, 315 million clips and rail pads at 315 million. That's a lot of manufacturing that has to be done. Ballast, ballast is granite, rock and stone. Transit systems don't use small stones and high speed rail does not always use ballast but it's nice to have it because it keeps everything in place. In several regions, quarries will be needed to blast and pick up six tons uh, of ballast per track mile or 180 plus million tons of ballast to build the 30,000 miles of rail, uh, um, rail systems across the country. Fencing. We need to put fencing in because we have a problem in this country. People try to beat uh, the rail trains to the grade crossings. And you need rail if you're going to be using high-speed rail or anything over 50 or 60 miles an hour. You cannot go 225, 000, uh, 225 miles per hour without it being fenced in. And even if you have to raise the rail up, 
you still have to have a fence barrier. So you need 30,000 track miles or miles of manufactured fencing. Signal systems are, right? Depending on the type of rail system we're gonna use, we have to develop a, a signal system that has to be manufactured. Cybersecurity has to be put in. It goes down on a high-speed rail system, every one-tenth of a mile or a max of 3,000 units. That's all of these machines have to be put in. And at the same time as, as they're being put in here and, and providing information, it goes to the control centers and every and it's all interconnected with the cab of the locomotive. That's a lot, that's again a lot of manufacturing done off-site away from the project. Maintenance facilities, if you're gonna run 30,000 miles worth of trains, uh, you need 135 facilities to maintain the traveling rail equipment uh, and, all, and all of these facilities. This is just two facilities that uh, I had gotten pictures of, but there's gonna be millions of components that are gonna to have to be made and supplied to these units because every, once a train uh, goes about 10 or 20,000 miles, they do a running repair. When they go 50,000 miles or more, they do a heavy repair. Stations and control centers, okay? We're gonna need 1,400 stations and 30 regional control centers. It doesn't matter the type of rail. It could be high-speed rail. It could be uh, uh, a regular commuter rail or passenger rail, or it could be light rail. This is Washington, this is Charlotte, North Carolina, this is Wilmington, Delaware. It all has to be, it all has to be um, done. And these stations will all have components that are gonna have to be manufactured elsewhere, not part of the overall project itself. Equipment, we're going to need uh, sheets of aluminum, sheets of aluminum to provide all of the necessary uh, shells for, uh, for uh, the equipment. There's gonna be a need for 3,500 locomotives, 12,000 coaches, 2,500 work cars, 1,000 inspection, uh, inspection cars, and 500 specialty units. It's not just the aluminum on the side, it's all the steel and the steel wheels underneath. They'll all be made in a manufacturing plant other than on the actual railroad or roadbed. Propulsion electricity. I put up this sign. This was, this was used in the early 19 teens by the Pennsylvania Railroad to decide how they were going to electrify. Uh, the use of electricity in all forms of rail transportation is critical if we're going to keep regions uh, that have corridors clean, efficient, with reduced ongoing maintenance. Electricity is the best way to do it. Now, recent history, I was responsible for uh, the electrification project that Amtrak had be, ha between New Haven, Connecticut and uh, Boston, Massachusetts. That was 150 miles of electrified track. It required four interconnections to the utility companies. Uh, so, Relating that to 30,000 track miles, we're going to need 200 interconnection substations and 400 redirecting stations. That's what's going to have to be hooked up to the individual grids. Now, the railroad itself would not pay for the grid to reach the roadway, but the, but the railroad would have to pay for its substations. And the reason for that is if we look at the railroad uh, regulations, they're going to be triple redundant. That means that after you come to, uh, after the utility company comes to the uh, substation, they're gonna pick up the tab for their transformer, but then the railroad's gonna need three or four transformers and they need to be able to control it because they're controlling the power that's out on the railroad. So I, it's critical that if you're going to use a railroad and make it electronic, 
you have to be able to have all of these interconnections. And uh, it, it's, it's more important for the redundancy factor. Uh, I'll give you a little story. The last time that there was a blackout in New York City, Amtrak was the only electricity coming into New York City and trains kept on moving because the electricity was brought in through their own interconnections after it was provided by utilities down in the South. So I'm just pointing this out because all this has to be done outside of a regular rail project. And I would imagine that we're gonna have to have five, six, maybe 20 rail projects throughout the country going. So they, they all have to be manufactured and, and done off site and then brought to site. There's never a stupid question or comment. If you have any questions or comments, you can address them to me. I've provided this. We're going to discuss this a little bit further. So I thanks for thanks so much for your time. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lou Spencer. I'm the assistant business manager with Plumbers and Gas Fitters Local Union Number no. Five. I'm a strong supporter of uh, the National Infrastructure Bank. And what does all of this mean? What What are we discussing this evening? If we're going to build infrastructure, we're going to need product to build the infrastructure. The good news when it comes to concrete, masonry, metals, wood and plastics, piping, wiring, cabling, those products are manufactured in the United States. Although there's sometimes those products come at a premium. If, uh, if we mandate uh, Buy America or Buy American product, we're going to need to pay just a little bit more for those products. But the good news is, is as we improve infrastructure in this country, if we create the demand for these American made products, we will be able to drive the cost down. And also the improved infrastructure will allow us to um, get those products to the job sites a lot easier and a lot safer. So the infrastructure bank complements manufacturing and manufacturing complements the, um, the growth and the development of our infrastructure. I did some research recently, and uh, the good news is, is that there is plenty of plants and manufacturers that produce concrete and Portland cement in this country, along with masonry product and metals. Uh, quite a few um, manufacturers still make American-made metals and steel used in construction. The same with wood and plastics. As we build um, electrical projects and water treatment projects, we're going to need thermal and moisture protection. Those products are available in the United States as are doors and windows and finishes, tile, drywall. Those things that'll be used in offices in these products projects are also available. There's always specialty product necessary in construction and in infrastructure work along with lots of equipment and furnishings. And again, all these products are available in the United States. There's always special construction, um, lighting, cathodic protection, pre-engineered structures. These products are available as well. And when it comes to mechanical and piping systems, copper tube still manufactured in this country, cast iron pipe, ductile iron pipe, as is um, copper wool wiring. So the products are available. We can build the infrastructure. And as we build the infrastructure, it makes it easier to transport these products around the country. And for that matter, we become an exporter of these products. So the infrastructure bank will help develop our manufacturing base. And our manufacturing base will help grow our infrastructure. And the United States can become a supplier uh, to the rest of the world. And um, time is of the essence. Our competitors, Europe, China, uh, in some cases friendly competitors, in some cases not so friendly. Uh, the time is now and um, there's no need to wait. We can do this. We can have the infrastructure bank, we can grow the American co economy and we can grow our manufacturing base. Thank you. Thank you to all of the speakers. That was a great uh, overview of uh, what uh, the National Infrastructure Bank will do to uh, incentivize manufacturing. And so I would like to open it to a little bit of a discussion among ourselves. Uh, 
one thing that's really interesting is if you could tell me where do we uh, have a database for all these providers of manufacturing inputs that a construction manager can make use of when they're uh, uh, managing a job and building out a, a project. Can, can you talk about uh, some of those um, places of information of where you can find these manufacturers? Lou, how about you? Sure. Um, in my research, Thomas Net is a, um, um, a clearinghouse of information for construction projects. And then there are the trade associations, um, the various trade associations that, pre that uh, represent these different manufacturers. Um, the Institute for Supply Management may be another area that we can go to for information. But um, the Construction Standards Institute has a master format specification. And in that master format specification, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of products that are listed. And um, when an architect or an engineer designs a project, they will usually allow the contractor to substitute like uh, similar uh, materials or equal materials. And um, everybody likes to get three prices. So we're looking not for just one manufacturer, but for three, so that competitive bidding can uh, keep our pricing in check. And um, yes, I would say the trade associations that represent these various products and various manufacturing groups is probably our best bet. Stan, how about rail? Uh, I would add to that, and, and uh, Lou, that, that's, that was a very good explanation. I would say that uh, the actual railroad organizations that are out there, like an Amtrak, like a Norfolk Southern, uh, like a CSX, like Burlington Northern, they all have very large procurement departments that have all those statistics that are out there. Uh, along with the vendors who are producing these products. Uh, I could tell you off the top of my head, like the clips that I was mentioning uh, are steel clips. Panroll is a company that, that does that. But those organizations would have uh, all of them out there. And as Lou has mentioned, you need at least three or more uh, out there to do a bid. Now, the, st the strange part, or not strange, but the, the issue that I would see is a lot of these very major projects like the Gateway Project and, and some of the things that we've, we've talked about in the past don't really exist right now because um, uh, there's not no, there is not any funding to do that. However, I think the people will start crawling out of the woodwork, we'll say, to become vendors that will produce some of these things. They're probably producing something else right now, but they can move right over. That's why that there's usually, before you go through an RFP process, you have you go through an RFQ process, whereby you would ask for quotations on specifications for the rail, the clips, the pads, everything that's out there. Anything that I mentioned in my presentation, a procurement department would have a complete list of everything that's out there. That is so interesting. Thank you for that. And how about latest technologies? One thing we wanna make sure is that we're building 21st century um, smart technologies. I know, for example, uh, Stan, that there's a lot of smart technology involved in um, sort of traffic control for rail and um, you know delivery systems and scheduling and those kinds of things. Uh, can you say a little bit about smart technologies for rail, and then we'll go to Sue for the loot for the same thing for construction. Uh, again, I, I would mention that those those the procurement folks at at the Amtrak and the other freight road, any class one railroad, their procurement department would know that. I could tell you Amtrak does a lot of its own research along with uh, retaining certain IT groups to work on that. One thing I'd also like to point out uh, is the fact that within the last two weeks that the class one railroads, including Amtrak, have upgraded their apprenticeship programs and they're now going out and, and building additional facilities to train people to do some of these things. Remember, 
at least Amtrak got a good deal of money to work on projects. So, and, and the freight railroads are going to get a little bit of it. That's why they're going ahead with their apprenticeship programs. But to answer your question, again, we have to go to the procurement departments. They will know. Lou, can you say something about smart technologies in construction, especially, uh, you know, water uh, refining systems, uh, a grading uh, stormwater systems, for example, to, to have the best flow underneath the roads where we can't see what's going on, any kind of things in those areas? Sure. Um, the big thing in the construction industry right now is global positioning satellite uh, using uh, coordinated points to um, lay out the project. Uh, we're designing complex structures these days and through the use of computers and uh, a thing called Tremble. Um, they can lay out these complex structures in a matter of hours, whereas before it took days to get a uh, good line and grade and inserts and um, knowing exactly where we were gonna put sleeves and inserts in a concrete structure, say before the pour. Um, we're using drones to evaluate the work, to uh, look at site conditions before the work begins and monitor construction projects as they progress. And as Stan said, all of these things are being taught in the apprenticeship programs throughout the building trades. Um, the trades embrace technological change and um, they just want to be sure that we have the right people, skilled people, highly paid people operating this machinery and these, these, uh, this technology so that it's used properly and uh, most effectively. The other thing that I would like to mention is we need to do this work in an environmentally friendly manner. And um, I think for the sake of the country and all the above energy approach is probably best. But when it comes to making these products that we're going to need to build infrastructure and to manufacture products to sell to the entire world, uh, we wanna do that in a safe way. And I think that's where the colleges and universities come in if we have resources that we want to use and products that we want to make, um, our universities and colleges can help us figure the best way to make these things safe, safely and efficiently. So I think that the um, maybe loans and grants uh, to colleges and universities might actually help supplement um, the infrastructure that we're going to need to build. Right. And while you're on this topic of environmentally friendly, these construction inputs are going to use a lot of cement mm -hmm. and cement produces 8% of the world's uh, CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be paying for CO2 sequestering cement as part of our projects. Maybe you could say something about that. And also steel. Uh, a lot of the pivot in the steel industry is to recycled steel. Uh, that's used that is uh, developed with with arc welding instead of the old fashioned coal producing type of steel. So maybe you could say something about those two kinds of inputs and how they can be made environmentally more friendly. Well, I know that a lot of industries want to go to carbon capture, and um, I think that would be a good technology to use. Um, I'm not the expert in this field, but uh, I'm sure that we can um, we can find the experts to uh, to do this work. We have to, we have to build the infrastructure. We have to do it in an economic fashion. We have to do it in an environmentally safe manner. So um, we're Americans, we can do anything. We can build anything and we can build it uh, economically and, and, and safely. Great. And Stan, one of the big wastages of, uh, of in, in our environmental factor in the United States is traffic congestion which the National Infrastructure Bank wants to do a lot more or to put rail and commuter rail into the transportation mix to substitute for all those cars that are sitting uh, stuck in traffic on roads and wasting super tankers full of fuel going up into the uh, up into the air. Can you say something about planning for uh, transportation and commuters uh, to, uh, you know, to get folks off of roads and into commuter rail um, and around big urban cities, how does that work? Well, I would say that uh, right now, 
when you look at how we want to put in all these rail systems, and you and I have discussed this on many occasions, you're talking about 30,000 miles worth of rail. Some of it is light rail, some of it is conventional rail, some of it is high-speed rail. So we have a mix of it. We have to work with the regional planning associations and let them go through their reiterations to see how where they want to travel to and how do they get people off the road and where they would put their major stations in and then they would when they would put in their their uh, uh rural stations because what we're trying to do is move people from rural areas into the cities uh and network with a high-speed rail system that will take them from one end of the country to the other end of the country those regional planning associations know what's in their areas they know what are the rural areas what are the the, the medium-sized areas and what is the urban areas and we have to get with them and get them to look at what they really want to do in so far as strengthening uh the the network of rail transportation and mix it with others uh, if you look at a city like new york or philadelphia they're always mixing rail with buses and let them flow out and i think a rail so uh, a, a regional planning association can do those things because we want to look at what the mix should be you can't take people off of the road unless you have a decent mix of how people are going to get to work and get away from work right and while you're on that topic Stan, um we want to build much more affordable housing so we want to have that logistically linked with our uh transportation systems and better connect rural areas both with rail and with broadband so that we keep those economies viable so say something about how regional planning associations can help well, there it, as well it, the regional planning association will look at not just transportation it's going to look at housing it's going to look at all the facilities that are necessary uh, again we're talking about sectors like water like broadband like uh transportation all of those things fit together and a regional planning association can look at it and see what they need uh, and where the, the housing should go. We certainly don't want to build housing where we don't have water, good water systems. So all that's got to be figured out. And one thing you I'm glad that you mentioned housing. When we talk about manufacturing, we've always said that the bank wants to put in 7 million housing units across the country. Think about from a manufacturing point of, of view, all the wire, the conduits, the receptacles, the light switches that have to be manufactured in different parts of the country and brought in. We're practically doubling the size of what's being manufactured right now. Mm -hmm. Right. So those are gr all great inputs. Thank you very much for that information. Is there anything that either of you would like to add on what this is going to do for manufacturing in the United States? Well, one thing I would like to say is if the COVID pandemic taught us anything is that uh, some people are going to want to work from home. And um, I think we're going to see a lot more mixed use projects where uh, we have office buildings mixed with uh, residential. Um, people are going to live where they're going to live. People are going to work where they're where they're going to work. And we're going to Stan said, as Stan indicated, we're going to need the transportation modes to get people to and from their jobs. And I suspect that probably in the future, younger people will want to be located close to urban centers, but I think they'll probably want to spend their weekends out in the country. And if that manufacturing plant is out in a rural area, there again, that those, those uh, employees are going to need to work closer to that plant. And then uh, product is going to need to travel in and out of that plant. So uh, the time is now for this National Infrastructure Bank. Great point. And Stan, how about the you? The only thing that, that I would add to that, and Lou, Lou broadcasts that very well when he starts talking about people want to live in urban areas, or the younger folks want to live in the urban areas, but the plants might be on the outside. The issue of transportation is it's going to run 24-7 in most cases to get out of the urban areas, and it will bring those individuals on weekends away from the city where they want to be. And it would be a much better way of travel than getting in a car and have everybody drive out to the rural areas. So I, I think the issue is we need to get, develop 
uh, within the regional planning associations, the strategy to move forward on everything that the bank is going and the, to cover. The high-speed rail lines, for example, that the National Infrastructure Bank has looked at a, in a preliminary fashion, they run along these economic corridors and commuting corridors. I mean, just look at the com commuting corridor from Boston all the way down to Miami. Hugely traveled road, over congested, not safe uh, from traffic accidents. And people would love to just get in a high speed rail train and go from one city to another and not have to worry about that traffic. It would be great. And, and you're absolutely right. And people are not, they're not going to want to take their car. And the aviation fuel costs are going to be too high. And you're not going to want to take the airplane anymore. Right. And I would like to take my prerogative as a macroeconomist and just say one more time what effect this is going to have on the American economy. I know people, you know, may glaze over a little bit when we talk about gross domestic product and, you know, we'll be able to produce more and we'll be able to produce more efficiently. But the bottom line is this will reduce inflation. It will put money into people's pockets. It will lower commuter times for everybody, give people a safe, affordable place to live. And what could be better than all of this while we're promoting our American manufacturing base and get back, getting back to what we used to do really well uh, a, a long time ago, and we can do so again. Thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate your coming and visiting with us today. Thank you. Thank you.